So we are going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Aloni. I'm with Schneps Media, and this webinar is Pancreatic Cancer from Screening to Treatment. I want to tell you a little bit about Schneps Media, and then we'll get started. But Schneps Media is one of the largest local media companies, publishing over 70 newspapers, magazines, websites, webinars, podcasts, and events throughout Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Westchester, Long Island, the East End, and Philadelphia. Today, we have the good fortune to speaking with top experts who've joined to demystify pancreatic cancer. Our experts will discuss warning signs of pancreatic cancer, who is most at risk for developing it, and what are the current treatments available if diagnosed. I'd like to get started by introducing our illustrious panel. First, please welcome Dr. Gulam Manji. He's attending physician in the Department of Medical Oncology at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Dr. Manji is part of the medical oncology team, is leading research and clinical trials with the goal of developing new treatments and therapies for pancreatic cancer patients at the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center. He's been the recipient of multiple awards, including the Young Investigator Award in 2015 from the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the Rising Star Award from the National Pancreas Foundation in 2019. Welcome, Dr. Gulam. Next, you. please welcome Dr. David Horowitz. He's an attending physician in the Department of Radiation Oncology at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. As a member of the Pancreas Center, Dr. Horowitz brings his leading expertise in radiation oncology to care for all pancreatic cancer case types. He developed the use of multiple radiation techniques at Columbia to ensure patients receive the most effective treatments possible while minimizing potential side effects. This includes novel techniques for both image-guided as well as adaptive radiation therapies. Dr. Horowitz is also the program director for the Radiation Oncology Res Residency Program, which shapes the next generation of leaders in this field. Welcome, Dr. Horowitz. Thanks very much. And finally, please welcome Dr. John Chabot, Executive Director of the Pancreas Center and Attending Surgeon in Chief of the Division of GI Endocrine Surgery at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Dr. Chabot began his medical career at Columbia, where he completed his internship, residency, and fellowship training and is now the Division Chief of GI Endocrine Surgery. In addition to serving as the Executive Director of the Pancreas Center, Dr. Chabot is also a Professor of Surgery and has dedicated his career to the prevention, treatment, and cure of pancreatic cancer. We are very lucky to have all of you with us. Welcome, Dr. Chabot. Thank you, Elizabeth. So let's get started. Dr. Manji, let's get started with the basic. How does pancreatic cancer form and how common is it? Thanks, uh, Elizabeth. So um, in order to do a quick introduction as far as how pancreas cancer forms first, um, I think it's important to point out what pancreas, what the pancreas is. So the pancreas is an organ in, within, within the abdomen and it sits behind the stomach. Um, and the function of it is that it produces and releases key enzymes that help, that help with digestion. And it also produces hormones that help manage our blood sugar. And this is important to understand because when the organ doesn't function, the adverse events come into play. And that's when the signs that something is not right comes up. Um, pancreas cancer begins in the cells that actually line the ducts that carry the digestive enzymes out of the pancreas and release it into um, the bottom part of the stomach. So whenever we eat um, automatically, the pancreas uh, releases these enzymes in, in anticipation that the food is going to come in and it helps aid in digestion. So it is really these lining, the, the cells that line these ducts that go awry. And we know from uh, many years of, uh, of uh, experiments and studies that have shown that there are key, mut key mutations within the DNA and mutations are damages that occur in the DNA that are the initial events that occur in a cascade of further mutations that really form the cancers. Now the question is, how do we get these mutations? Um, it's one of three ways. Um, one is that we inherit the mutations from one of our parents. So that puts us at increased risk of uh, 
of developing pancreas cancer. Uh, others are behaviors such as smoking, which is linked with pancreas cancer. And the third is that it is just by chance and an unfortunate event that a mutation occurs that leads to this cascade. Thank you for that. Now, how common is this cancer? So luckily, pancreas cancer is actually fairly rare. Uh, it's, uh, it's a low incidence cancer in, in men it's the ninth leading incident, uh, and in female, it's the eighth leading incident cancer type. So roughly about 30,000 patients are uh, predicted to be diagnosed in 2021. However, unfortunately, the mortality uh, is extremely high. It's the fourth leading cancer-related uh, death for both sexes, and unfortunately, in 2030, it is expected to be the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths. Wow, why is, why is that changed uh, between now and then? So I think that um, unfortunate for pancreas cancer, even though we have made advances in treatment, I think that there are um, better treatments that have come about for breast cancer and for lung cancer, where the mortality has decreased. Mm -hmm. And for, for pancreas cancer, even though we have doubled um, the cure rates over the last decade, um, we haven't really caught up to the advances that have been made in other histologies. Uh, also, it appears that very slowly the incidence of pancreas cancer is also on the rise. Hmm. Okay. Well, and speaking about the, the rise of that, are there specific groups? You talked about hereditary, but are there other specific groups that are more at risk? Right. So I think that what we need to think about risk factors um, for pancreas cancer that are reversible and putting them into a category of non-reversible. Um, so talking about the reversible causes first is uh, smoking. So we know that smoking uh, increases the risk of pancreas cancer uh, compared to those, those folks that do not smoke and it doubles our risk. And wow. it is estimated that about a quarter of the pancreas cancers that, that we see are, are caused by cigarette smoking. And it's just, and it is not just um, smoking the cigarettes. The, the thought is that also cigars or smokeless tobacco may also uh, cause an increased risk of uh, patients to develop pancreas cancer. And, and the neat thing is that there are some studies that show that risk of pancreas cancer starts to decline once an individual stops smoking. Um, so so if, if anyone is interested, um, you know, I, I urge them to seek, uh, you know, medical help to try and stop smoking so that you don't even decrease the risk of lung cancer, but also uh, you can decrease your risk mm -hmm. of developing pancreas cancer. And on another note, you know, um, patients have already uh, have been diagnosed with pancreas cancer. If they continue to smoke, um, their survival is reduced compared to patients who, who do not smoke. So, or, or stop smoking. So there's an incentive even after uh, being diagnosed with pancreas cancer that you should really try to attempt um, to stop smoking. Um, the other risk factors are obesity. So being overweight. And uh, so if you have a body mass index greater, greater than 30, um, there is an increase 20% more likelihood that, you, that an individual is at risk. Um, truncal obesity, meaning that gaining weight uh, right around the waist, but not being overweight also uh, may put you at risk, uh, increased risk. Mm -hmm. Type 2 diabetes uh, puts you at increased risk. And, and lastly, one of the reversible causes is chronic pancreatitis um, that is linked with smoking and heavy alcohol use. Uh, so those are the reversible uh, risk factors. The non-reversible risk factors, unfortunately, are aging. So as we age, we are at increased risk of developing uh, pancreas cancer. Uh, nearly two thirds of patients that are diagnosed with pancreas cancer uh, are diagnosed at the age of 65 or over, um, being male gender. Um, and then African-Americans, unfortunately, are also at slight uh, increased risk, but there are other factors such as diabetes, smoking, and OBCD that, that may also be linked uh, to that, which, which further needs to be uh, teased out. Um, and lastly, it's the family history. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, about 10% of pancreas cancers are thought to be hereditary in, in nature, meaning that um, those patients who developed uh, hereditary uh, pancreatic cancer uh, probably or, or did uh, inherit uh, a mutation from one of their parents that puts them at increased risk. Uh, a common um, gene that is identified and known is BRCA1 and BRCA2. So uh, many patients or individuals know BRCA2 mutations and associated with, with breast cancer, but, um, but BRCA's, BRCA mutation in BRCA genes definitely puts you at increased risk for pancreas cancer as well. And there are many different genes that are being identified. And there are also syndromes which relate some of these mutations to different types of cancers. So um, it's important to know, you know, family history of cancer. So uh, if there are individuals uh, whose family history uh, is strong for breast cancer, for melanoma, for pancreas cancer, for colon cancer, um, it's important to talk to your uh, physician to see whether uh, you should you are at increased risk for pancreas cancer as well. So these so other, if, other if I can jump in for just a second, um, I think Dr. Manji had a moment of wishful thinking um, when he answered your question as to how many people will get pancreatic cancer uh, in 2021. It's more like 50,000. Golam, you said 30,000. Wow. Yeah, 30,000 uh, for each male and 30,000 for female. So putting it together, 50 to 60,000. And unfortunately, that incidence is, is increasing. So it sounds like there are a host of things that one can control to reduce their risks, like smoking, their weight, controlling their diabetes, uh, pancreatitis, dealing with that. Um, and then there are the pieces that can't be controlled, but can be it's screened for to be able to give you more information to then address. Right, exactly. You know, unfortunately, with irreversible such as age, gender, race, you know, I don't think that that justifies increased screening. Uh, but definitely, you know, knowing your family history, knowing that there is an increased incidence of such as breast cancer uh, or pancreas cancer, um, that those patients should speak to their. Uh, physician to see whether they they should be screened. Thank you for that. So we know what, what to look for and we know what to, we should need to talk to our doctors about for our family history to set us up in the right direction. What about warning signs? Are there early warning signs that one should look out for with pancreatic right. cancer? So, um, you know, so th there are a few. Um, uh, pain, back pain, uh, persistent back pain and abdominal pain. Um, that just won't go away uh, is something that, that, you know, there should be extra vigilance. Um, you know, it, it, again, uh, since most of the patients are at the age of 65, where there's chronic back pain uh, is, is a common issue, but if there's persistent sort of gnawing, you know, gnawing back pain uh, in the setting of unintentional weight loss. So all of a sudden, you know, um, you're trying to lose weight, but the weight is just sort of melting away. Uh, and you have sort of epigastric or abdominal pain or you know, in association with back pain, that definitely should sort of make you wonder that, that we need to investigate this further. Um, dark urine, yellowing of the eyes, um, light colored stools that are floating and not sinking, um, um, itchiness, constant itchiness of the skin, um, those are all signs that that something may not be not be right. Um, the other signs are um, a, a blood clot, for example, uh, a, a blood clot that happens in the lower extremities that that is unprovoked, meaning that um, there are not other reasons why a patient developed a blood clot. And then in combination with that, you know, abdominal discomfort. So a constellation of some of these signs should uh, lead to further investigation. And, and also an important one is uh, someone who is sort of elderly over, over the age of 50 or 60, never had a history of diabetes and all of a sudden has new onset uh, diabetes that's very difficult to control where you require insulin or patients who have had very well controlled diabetes and all of a sudden are requiring 
um, insulin at high levels of insulin, uh, and then again, losing weight at the same time should sort of put a red flag and, and make sure that something else is not underlying, uh, such, as, such as a pancreas tumor. Thank you for sharing those warning signs. So if you have those, certainly should be seeing a doctor and, and addressing them. So how is pancreatic cancer identified and diagnosed? Right, so usually one of these warning signs lead uh, a patient to go to their primary care physician. For example, if it has jaundice, darkening of the urine, uh, a normal blood test is done. And what that, that will show is that there is an uh, abnormal liver enzymes and that will then lead to either an ultrasound or a CT scan or an MRI of the abdomen, which will then identify um, that there is most likely a mass in the pancreas. Or uh, if they cannot see the pancreas mass, and, and that can happen, there will be an abrupt cutoff of the duct uh, in the pancreas. So that will lead to further investigation and the patient will then be referred to a gastroenterologist who will then perform an endoscopy with an ultrasound and to look for this mass and do a biopsy, which will then confirm, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, pancreas adenocarcinoma. Now, what are the four categories? You know, what is, what is the process that a patient may go through? Uh, you're talking about the stages of pancreas cancer? Yes. Right. Yeah. So, you know, normally with many different cancers, we think about stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Um, in, in, in pancreas cancer, I think that we need to think about, uh, think about the staging more practically, meaning that uh, what are the tools that we can use to truly treat this cancer? Um, you know, the only, unfortunately, <clears throat> right now, the only curative option that we have is surgery in combination with chemotherapy and potentially radiation treatment, <clears throat> excuse me. So we need to see whether the tumor is localized within the pancreas such that it can be effectively removed such that no tumor can be left behind, right? And Dr. Chabot and, and Dr. Horowitz will later uh, discuss that further. And the way that we usually determine if that's the case is that the tumor has to be to be, it has to be away from any of the critical vessels. Um, so vessels that can be um, uh, reconstructed such that they can be removed and replaced, then you can have a curative surgery. However, there are certain vessels that cannot be replaced. And Dr. Chabot, I'm sure we'll go into detail further. That determines whether the patient is resectable or is localized, but not resectable. So we call them locally advanced. So you have resectable, locally advanced, and unfortunately, the most extensive disease is disease that has spread away from the pancreas, meaning either it's gone to the liver, it's gone to the abdomen, or it's gone to the lung. In those cases, resection is not indicated because unfortunately, when pancreas cancer has spread, unlike other cancers, such as colon cancer, where you may have some disease that has spread oligometastatic disease, you can still go ahead and remove the primary tumor and then go after the few metastatic lesions. In pancreas cancer, unfortunately, we think that if the cancer has already spread, even though if there are few lesions, there are certainly most likely additional smaller lesions that you cannot see yet. So the effective treatment there is systemic chemotherapy. And in very rare cases, if you have certain molecular signatures, that's when targeted therapy or immunotherapy may become indicated. However, for a majority of patients, and I'm talking about greater than 98, 99% of patients, systemic chemotherapy is, is the way to go. So I do want to go more into the different treatments of, um, of the cancer, but can you share with me a little bit about, you know, how things work at New York Presbyterian, how, how the multidisciplinary team works to be able to analyze what type of treatment plan should be in place? And, and Dr. Chabot, Dr. Horowitz, feel free to jump in on this as well. Right. So, uh, you know, pancreas cancer is, um, the, the anatomic location is such 
that it requires multiple expertise. So uh, medical oncologists, surgery, radiation oncologists, uh, a very expert radiologist, and an interventional gastroenterologist, and also probably a geneticist, because now every patient with pancreas cancer is undergoing a genetic screen, right? Um, so it's complex, and no one person can do it by themselves. So every patient that is newly diagnosed with pancreas cancer at Columbia, at New York Presbyterian, is presented at a multidisciplinary conference where each individual case is discussed, um, the radiology, the scans are reviewed uh, with radiology, and there is a consensus and a plan devised for that individual patient so that we can get maximum benefit. And I'll let my colleagues discuss it further. I think one important thing to add is that you want to develop a long-term strategic plan for each patient, not just, I'm going to give this patient chemotherapy and see what happens and we'll make other decisions you know, in the future. Um, we think through all of the potential um, twists and turns for an individual patient. And of course, plans may change, but we try to come up with a strategic plan with a goal at the end. Um, and that avoids making mistakes, um, going down the wrong path and burning bridges that down the line, we may realize a bridge has been burned. And, and that's why we really work hard at the very beginning to develop that strategic plan for each patient. The only other thing that I would add to that is from the very beginning, when we're identifying what that strategic plan is for a patient, we always want to think about what sort of cutting edge research options there are. You know, as Dr. Manji was saying, um, as much as we've had some success in improving survival for patients with pancreatic cancer, uh, we're, we're still not anywhere close to where we want to be. And the only way to really improve that is to do rigorous clinical trials. And so that's something that's evaluated for every single patient at each stage of their evaluation. Uh, and so being able to evaluate that from the very beginning, make sure that patients have the most options available to them. That's really extraordinary, you know, thinking about it from a patient's perspective to know that you're going to have um, all of these educated minds looking at their case in particular and making the right decision for treatment plans. Um, it certainly provides a lot of hope to me as, as a potential patient. Um, so Dr. Horowitz, let, let's, let's stay with you for a minute here. What if radio, radiotherapy is needed? Yes, yeah, so that, that's a really interesting question. And the role for radiation in the treatment of pancreas cancer uh, is frankly controversial. Um, and like Dr. Manji was saying, the anatomic location of where the pancreas is and where tumors arise within the pancreas makes surgery difficult for a lot of patients. There are a lot of blood vessels that pass right by the pancreas and get involved um, by tumors very early. And so making the determination of whether a patient has resectable disease, whether they have unresectable disease that can't be removed safely, or whether they fall into some sort of gray area is very important and has a lot of bearing on on what I do and how I approach the patients. For patients who have resectable disease, uh, typically radiation is not indicated. Um, patients are able to have surgery or have chemotherapy and then surgery. Uh, and in many cases where the tumor is removed completely, they don't need radiation treatment. Uh, we reserve radiation for resected pancreas cancer for the rare cases where there's uh, tumor that's left behind locally at the time of surgery. And in those cases, we approach that in combination with our colleagues from medical oncology. So patients get chemotherapy uh, and then uh, radiation that's focused on where that original tumor was and where uh, they're likely to have residual cancer that targeted treatment um, can affect. Now for patients who have uh, locally advanced cancer, but not spread to other organs where surgery can't safely be done. Um, in patients who have received chemotherapy and still have 
a localized problem. That's where a lot of exciting work is going on with radiation treatment, that we are looking to use our improved technologies to actually see where tumors are and target them precisely so that we can deliver high doses of radiation uh, to kill those cancer cells while doing so in a safe manner. In terms of anatomy, not just blood vessels, but there are a lot of organs that are sensitive to radiation that are very close to where the pancreas is, the stomach, the bowel, the kidneys uh, in particular. And so seeing where those sensitive organs are and coming up with a safe but effective radiation plan is really sort of at the cutting edge of where a lot of uh, radiation oncology is for treatment of pancreas cancers. Um, there are some exciting early studies that have been reported uh, showing that patients who get these high dose, very focused treatments can have improved survival uh, compared to older fashioned traditional courses uh, of radiation at lower doses. Uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done with that um, in order to figure out the best way to deliver treatment for those locally advanced tumors. Uh, but like Dr. Manji said, still at this point, the ultimate goal for patients with localized pancreas cancer is to try to get them to surgery, right? And if patients don't have uh, tumors that are resectable at diagnosis, we wanna work to try to get them to a point where Dr. Chabot and his surgical colleagues uh, can safely remove these tumors completely. Um, and so we typically start with a course of multi-agent chemotherapy which I'm sure Dr. Manji could speak to in more detail, again, to try to shrink the tumor locally, as well as reduce the risk of early spread to other organs so that that tumor remains localized. Um, after their chemotherapy, we evaluate to see if those patients um, can proceed to surgery. If they can safely, um, we typically can avoid radiation. If they can't, if there's still um, involvement of blood vessels, um, that's where I have my role again to try to uh, kill as many of those cancer cells, particularly around where the tumor interfaces with those blood vessels so that I can make Dr. Chabot's job easier um, and so that he can proceed to surgery uh, for these patients and remove tumors completely. So it's sort of three areas where we try to, um, to impact our patients um, mm -hmm. and, and try to get them to surgery whenever possible. Now there's a fourth phase where we um, can deliver radiation locally uh, to pancreas tumors, even in the case of patients who have disease that might've spread to other organs. And that's to particularly help with symptoms. Um, the palliative um, role of radiation is very important uh, to try to improve things like pain, uh, make sure that these tumors aren't causing local problems, even if the main part of their treatment um, is systemic with Dr. Manji. And so we really wanna have um, an eye on these patients at all phases of their treatment to make sure that they have all available options to them. Thank you for that. I mean, you mentioned you talk, talking about chemotherapy and I wanna hear a little bit more about what a patient can expect before, during and after radiology, radi radiotherapy. But Dr. Manji, is chemotherapy always the starting point with pancreatic cancer? Uh, that's a... That's a controversial question a little bit for patients who have receptable disease. Uh, uh, there, 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 are, there is a clinical trial that is currently being um, sort of developed to ask this question, whether uh, in patients that can go directly to surgery, whether chemotherapy should be given before or should chemotherapy be given after. Um, and, and there, were, there were some studies that were done um, that were not really perfectly randomized and there were some um, caveats to, to that study. Uh, but you, know, you could envision that uh, there are patients who might already have micrometastatic disease, meaning that tiny amount of cells that have spread uh, within the body that we cannot see yet right, uh, with a scan. So, so there's a selection bias that we need to do. So in, in for those patients, it would be best to go ahead and do chemotherapy first and to make sure that those lesions do not appear because 
the, the, you know, the, the surgery is fairly intense and um, there is no advantage of those patients who have stage four disease to go to surgery. In fact, you know, when, when they do go to surgery, it is possible, you know, do, while they're recovering, they're not getting systemic therapy so that those, those micrometastatic uh, lesions are going unchecked. So um, at, here at Columbia, uh, we, we take uh, patients who have resectable disease straight to surgery, uh, but then we are very aggressive in getting them to recover quickly and then start adjuvant chemotherapy, meaning chemotherapy right after surgery. Uh, there are some institutions that are doing it the other way around, uh, and they're giving all patients chemotherapy first, and then then going ahead and, and treating those patients, uh, go, taking those patients for to for surgery. But like I mentioned, a clinical trial is being designed, and that question will hopefully give us some clarity. However, um, chemotherapy is for unfortunately all patients who are diagnosed with pancreas cancer. Here, it just depends on when you should get chemotherapy. However, patients who go directly to, to surgery will get chemotherapy for six months thereafter. Patients who have locally advanced disease, meaning that there is tumor that is attached to the blood vessels, we give them chemotherapy basically to shrink the tumor such that you can move away from the blood vessel so that you can get, you can do potentially radiation therapy and then surgery. And, and then if they have gotten four months of chemotherapy first before surgery, they will get two months of chemotherapy thereafter. And in stage four, unfortunately, chemotherapy is, is the mainstay. I see. So it sounds like, you know, this is the, again, the kind of thing where you discuss each patient individually to determine what should be used and when it should be used to best exactly. serve the patient. And even the chemotherapy choices are discussed during, during the discussion. And more importantly, we are not just thinking about like what Dr. Chabot said, what the immediate step is. Choosing a certain um, modality, radiation treatment, surgery, or even certain chemotherapies may impact a patient for the next step. So it's not that we are thinking about the next immediate step, we are thinking about the following steps uh, which we want to make sure that patients will not be precluded from clinical trials. I see. Uh, I'd like to just uh, embellish what Dr. Horowitz said about um, radiation treatments. Um, the neighborhood around the pancreas is incredibly complex anatomically with various organs touching the pancreas. So having a true expert um, who does radiation for pancreatic cancer all the time plan the radiation and deliver the radiation. And in particular for patients who we're trying to get to surgery, working closely with the surgeons so that they agree on what areas need high dose and what areas don't necessarily need high dose because they're gonna be taken out anyway. Those are, those are the sorts of details that having a true expert like Dr. Horowitz plan your radiation makes a huge difference. Yes, I can see that. So let me just circle back to Dr. Horowitz about that. Um, a patient who is using radiotherapy, what would, should they expect before, during, and after treatment? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And uh, frankly, a, a lot of what I do when I first meet patients and their families is uh, a lot of education. Uh, most people don't know very much about radiation, uh, except to know that, that radiation can be bad, right? Um, and that's frankly the case for, for many physicians who are not radiation oncologists. And so helping people to understand what that total process is like is, is really important. Um, but after that consultation, the first step for any patient's treatment is actually coming up with a unique plan just for them, right? Everybody's body is unique. Everybody's tumor is in a slightly different location, and the relationship of that tumor with blood vessels and with the normal organs around it is going to be different for everybody. And so we do a what we call a simulation CAT scan, which is a CAT scan like any other that people have had before, but we put them in the exact position we want to give them their treatment. So typically they're lying down with their arms sort of up over their head, and we have a bunch of devices to help keep them nice and still. Um, and 
these devices, they're almost like uh, bean bags that we pay, uh, place patients in and then we suck the air out of it and they take the shape of the patient. Um, there are other devices that we sometimes use where we mix different um, chemicals together and they produce a, a foam that sort of wraps around part of them. But it, it's unique for each individual patient. And the idea is to try to get them in the exact same position each time we give them their treatment. Um, we try to do very high quality CTs so that we can actually see the tumor as precisely as possible. And so we've actually worked with our colleagues in diagnostic radiology to not just do sort of standard simulation CAT scans uh, that are done at many centers, but really do pancreas protocol CAT scans as part of our simulation process so that we can really see exactly what our diagnostic radiology colleagues are seeing, and we can help define where those tumors are as precisely as possible. Um, after we do that planning session, after we do that CAT scan, we take a bunch of photographs, um, and then we give the patients a schedule for when they should come back for their treatment. It typically takes about a week, sometimes up to a week and a half to come up with a good plan for the radiation. Uh, we're fortunate to use very sophisticated computer software to help design where the radiation should be coming in. The, the way that we deliver the radiation are with uh, incredible machines called linear accelerators, and they can move around the patient in 360 degrees, and the table the patient is lying on during treatment can actually rotate um, so that the radiation comes in from multiple different angles and avoids too much dose to the normal organs as it's going in, but can sort of all intersect at the same point where that tumor is. Um, and that process, again, takes a long time to, to do and to then actually make sure that those machines can deliver that treatment that I've designed on the computer. There's a, a lot of quality assurance that goes into that. And so there's a big team of us here in radiation oncology that really um, is behind every single treatment. Um, you know, myself, our physicists, our therapists, um, as well as our nursing and nutrition staff to make sure that we're, we're actively and proactively um, helping our patients as they're going through these treatments. Now, depending on the different courses that we're giving, they can be getting five treatments, which might be given over a week or a week and a half. Um, but for some of these longer ablative courses of radiation for locally advanced or unresectable pancreas cancer, those might be three or five weeks of treatment. Um, and so managing symptoms as they uh, go through, whether it's tiredness, whether it's poor appetite, whether it's nausea, those are important things because helping people uh, maintain their energy, maintain their weight, um, it helps them feel better. It helps them get through the treatments easier. And frankly, if they're not losing weight, they look um, exactly the same when they're getting their treatment. And so the, the way the radiation is getting delivered to the tumor is closer to the way that I want it to be. And so that, that's a really important thing that we do. Um, and then, you know, frankly, during each treatment, we image and we check that we're treating the exact right spot, right? It's called image guided radiation therapy. Um, and we're matching down to about a millimeter or so uh, of accuracy. So we're really sure that we're hitting exactly what we want to hit and we're avoiding the things that we don't want to hit. And that helps um, helps kill as much tumor as possible, but also avoid side effects. Because uh, if you're not doing that, you don't know what you're treating. You don't know if you're treating the bowel. You don't know if you're treating the stomach. Um, and, and then you're getting potential side effects for patients. And so you have to be careful at each one of these steps to make sure your treatment is uh, as good as possible. Wow, thank you for that. That really sheds so much light on what has to happen um, and why. Thank you so much for that. So, you know, you talked, all of you talked about surgery. So I'd like to go to Dr. Chabot and, and talk more about that. So what if surgery is needed? You know, knowing that things vary by patient to patient, when is it appropriate course of action? Um, it, really, whenever we can is the answer. Um, it's uh, 
surgery, people are often afraid of surgery, you know, for good reason. Um, there's a lot of downside to having an operation, but people with pancreatic cancer, um, for the vast majority, the real opportunity for cure is getting them into the operating room. So when I tell a patient after they've been through four months of chemotherapy and, um, and two weeks of radiation therapy that yes, we are going to the operating room, they're jumping for joy usually, uh, which is fairly counterintuitive. Um, you know, these are big operations uh, and, and um, that's why we reserve them only for people we think have a real potential for cure. If, if we really don't think we have an opportunity to cure people, for example, somebody who has four spots in their liver that we've proven with a biopsy are cancer, um, they don't benefit from an operation. And in fact, by definition, they're harmed by an operation because it means for whatever recovery period after that operation, they're unable to get the treatments that they really benefit from. So we want to be aggressive. We want to operate on anybody who does have an opportunity for cure, but we also need to be realistic that surgery harms people. And when there isn't an opportunity for cure, we really should not be using it. Mm, it, it used to be that there were a number of different symptoms, blockages, that sort of thing that we did surgery for, even though we knew we couldn't cure people with pancreatic cancer, but they needed to have something fixed uh, to address symptoms. Almost all of those can be addressed now with interventional radiology techniques, interventional gastroenterology techniques, putting stents in various places, and for pain, uh, in particular, a radiation therapy. So we really try to only operate on people when there is, quote, curative intent. I see. So assuming that a patient is appropriate for surgery, what are some of the types of procedures that are done? Uh, th there are two basic uh, procedures that we use, you know, 99% of the time. That's a removing the head of the pancreas uh, called a Whipple operation. Um, the head of the pancreas is the more complex part. It includes the duct that carries pancreatic juice as well as the duct that carries bile. And it also means that we have to remove an attached piece of intestine. So once we get that specimen out, there are several um, reconstructions that we have to do to put the gastrointestinal system back together so people function normally. Uh, so that's the bigger of the two basic operations. The other is something called a distal pancreatectomy, which relates to the part of the pancreas to the left of the body. Um, that's um, easier in that there's no major reconstruction we have to do. We just need to get the piece of pancreas out that we're targeting that contains the tumor. And most of the time when we're talking about cancer surgery, of the distal pancreas, we include removal of the spleen. Okay, thank you for that. So what, what should a patient, and is it different with these different types of surgeries, what should they expect before, during, and after surgery? Uh, it's definitely different. Um, let, let's concentrate on the more complicated one, uh, the Whipple operation. Uh, that's the more common one that we do. Um, people, uh, if everything goes well, there we've got a, a sort of protocolized recovery plan for people. The first day after the operation, we do this, this, and this. The second day, um, they start you know, drinking liquids, um, and, and there's a steady progression of events um, over the course of their hospital recovery. And if they stay on that path, which the majority of patients do, um, they go home after about six days. At home, they are generally eating five, six, seven small meals a day. And we have a very, very um, restricted diet that we've learned over the years works well for people who have had this operation. Uh, there's a fair amount of fatigue. Um, surprisingly, um, 
there isn't much pain. And the reason there isn't much pain is that we have learned uh, how to manage early post-operative pain with multiple different simultaneous strat strategies that are synergistic. And if you avoid that peak of pain that tends to happen historically in people after the first day or two after surgery, their, their course with pain throughout their recovery is dramatically better. It's, it's that peak that gets their whole neurological system uh, sort of sensitized to pain. And, and we're now good at avoiding it with using multimodality uh, pain treatments. So fatigue, um, small frequent meals, um, not much pain. Um, when people have even more complex operations than the Whipple, when we have to remove blood vessels, replace them, uh, there can also be a significant diarrhea that can be a challenge to control. So those are sort of the dominant problems that people are dealing with in the first few weeks of recovery at home. And all of them gradually get better. People get to the point where they're eating most foods, perhaps not all foods, but most foods, and they're eating a more typical three meals a day. After five or six weeks, the fatigue tends to magically lift. And that, that corresponds to a change in people's metabolism. Um, and, uh, and, and when people have that diarrhea I spoke of, it, it can be a challenge to get under control, but once we get it under control, um, it's, it's usually durable. A longer term after pancreatic surgery, um, there's a chance of developing diabetes because we're removing a portion of the organ that makes insulin. And if people have a totally normal pancreas, we can remove quite a bit without developing diabetes. But most people, by the time they have a pancreatic cancer operation, most people have had some pre-existing damage to the pancreas just over a lifetime of use. And the more of that that has happened, the higher the chance of developing diabetes when we take a portion of the pancreas out. Mm -hmm. The other um, function of the pancreas, as Dr. Manji mentioned at the very beginning, is to manufacture these pancreatic enzymes that are crucial in the process of turning food into nutrients that the body can use. Um, it's relatively common uh, on the order of 50% or so of people who undergo pancreatic surgery that they need some supplementation with um, capsules that contain those pancreatic enzymes to digest their food properly. So those are sort of the in-hospital expectations, the early recovery phase expectations, and then the two long-term potential consequences of pancreatic surgery are the, the diabetes and the need for enzyme supplements. Thank you for that. And certainly is hopeful hearing how well someone can be after surgery. So thank you for that. Doctors, this, this information has really been extraordinary. And we do have a, a lot of wonderful questions from our attendees that I'd like to, to jump over to. Um, we have a question here um, from D. O'Reilly. What are warning signs? More important, what test should we ask our doctor if you do see a warning sign that you mentioned? What kind of test should we ask our doctor to conduct? Uh, why don't I take that one? Um, the, you have to use really high quality imaging to see the pancreas well. And when we're trying to diagnose a small tumor, it, it's even harder than diagnosing a big tumor that you know, we often find once people have imaging. So it's gotta be high quality imaging and it's gotta be um, a CAT scan or an MRI scan with a contrast agent. Um, all too often, all of us have seen people who had a CAT scan done for, for other things, uh, common to do a CAT scan, for example, for kidney stones. And those CAT scans are often done without intravenous contrast. And then we find six months later or a year later that somebody's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And the reason it wasn't seen is because the intravenous contrast wasn't given. So it's gotta be a high quality scan 
um, either a CAT scan or an MRI with intravenous contrast. Thank you, thank you for that. Mitchell said, my father died from pancreatic cancer at age 61, I am 71. Does that family history make me eligible for screening? I can, I can take that. I think um, just with that history, um, not um, in the sense of what I should say is that that doesn't um, qualify her as having a pedigree that is concerning. Uh, even though pancreas cancer is rare, if it if it does happen, it needs to be a constellation. So so a good family history where you need to know uh, the parents, the uncles, the aunts, the cousins. So uh, a good family history um, uh, with a physician um, needs to be done first. But just with that history uh, doesn't put her at higher risk that qualifies for screening. Uh, one, one caveat to that is if there's a, a family member who develops pancreatic cancer at a particularly young age. So I saw somebody uh, yesterday who is 47 and has pancreatic cancer. And that's th that in and of itself is enough to uh, consider the family at risk. And we've got a, a dedicated program. Um, it was actually endowed by an individual about 10 years ago uh, to um, do an in-depth family assessment. Um, so it's not me as a surgeon trying to look at that family history. We've got a dedicated program that includes both physicians and genetic counselors. So they include both the genetic analysis, the mutations that that particular patient has in their genes, as well as the family history. And then they build a surveillance program for siblings, for cousins, for children, and not only do they make a recommendation about the frequency of surveillance, but they have to also decide at what age does that surveillance begin for each patient. So it's a very complex undertaking. It's not something you should just go to your GP for. Um, it's really uh, something you wanna see an expert about. So it sounds like if you have a family history of a young person in your family, who has had pancreatic cancer, that this would be a reason to go and try and learn more about your potential. So, it, but it sounds like it's different than like breast cancer where you go and you find out if you have the BRCA gene and women can make decisions about removing a breast or with, it sounds like with pancreatic cancer and please tell me if, if this is true, is it um, watching the patient is really the, the mode of, of dealing with this family history? Uh, most of the time. Um, there are um, genetic mutations that produce pancreatic cancer with such frequency that will actually take the entire pancreas out. Mm -hmm. um, they're rare, thankfully, uh, because life without a pancreas is difficult. It's doable completely, um, but it's difficult. Um, but uh, for example, uh, one of the, the, the best example is a gene that causes chronic pancreatitis that usually starts when people are teenagers. And um, if we leave the pancreas in, the majority of them will have a pancreatic cancer by the time they're 50. So we usually try to take the pancreas out before people hit 40. That's one extreme example. Okay, thank you. Abby wanted to know, what are the chances of, that a tumor that is completely removed will come back? Gulam, you want to take that one? Right. So um, a very good answer. I mean, a very good question. It, 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 it's a little bit more complex, the answer. Um, it all depends uh, on whether uh, there are certain features when the surgery was done. So if the tumor is small, uh, the margins are negative, meaning that nothing was left behind microscopically. Uh, the number of lymph nodes, because whenever you do surgery, there are lymph nodes around the tumor and some of those lymph nodes can be involved. Um, so, um, so all of those uh, characteristics define prognosis and the, the rate or the risk of recurrence. Obviously, the smaller the tumor uh, without any lymph nodes has the best prognosis. 
Uh, however, everybody, the, the, the risk is still high enough. You know, if we, if we put everybody, uh, if we put lump everyone who undergoes surgery, um, I would estimate it around, you know, somewhere around 50% of the cases would be such that the cancer would come back. And for that reason, we give chemotherapy after surgery, curative intent surgery, to reduce that risk. Uh, and again, the rate of reduction is also dependent on individual cases and um, the size and the lymph node involvement, uh, the, the vessel involvement, the, the, the nerves that are running in, in, around the tumor, their involvement. So it's, it's, it's a complex uh, question and it's an individualized answer. Thank you, thank you for that. Lenore wanted to know, is constant farting a symptom of pancreatic cancer and who should I see to discuss it? Uh, most of the time it's not, um, but the people can develop what's called pancreatic insufficiency as their first manifestation of uh, pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic insufficiency just means that not enough of those pancreatic enzymes are mixing with the food and processing the food. And as that condition gets worse and worse, initially people have sort of cramps and bloating, excess gas, and that progresses to more and more frequent uh, diarrhea. Um, the, the fecal matter, um, will tend to float on the toilet water. There's off, often an oily um, uh, appearance to it and a foul odor. So most of the people who have excess flatulence do not have pancreatic cancer. I don't want you going to your doctor because um, I told you uh, you're, you're farting too much. Um, but you know, paying attention to any sort of progression um, with failure of your GI tract to process food normally does deserve um, an investigation. Thank you for that, Dr. Chabot. It is so important for you to listen to your body and, and to speak to your doctor about these things. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, there's so many questions and I wanna respect your time. I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions if that's okay. Um, I, I wanna respect your time in, uh, within your day. But Scott wanted to know um, smoking and what about using cannabis? Um, about causing that, causing pancreatic cancer? And does, you know, a brief time of smoking or smoking cannabis at an early age, and then you, you stop sudden cessation, it will still have an impact on pancreatic cancer development. I can take that. Um, so there was a, a very good study that was done that actually looked at the extent, so the intensity and the duration. Um, and it turns out that there is actually a dose response, meaning that the more intense and the, the longer you smoke, the, the incidence of pancreas cancer goes up. So it's, it's, it's a relationship between that. Um, I'm not aware of cannabis. Um, usually these uh, studies were done with tobacco products. So um, um, I, I, you know, not aware of a, uh, an association between cannabis and, and pancreas cancer. Error on the side of caution and don't smoke. Um, what about, um, Karen wants to know about a pancreas transplant. Is that an option? Is that something that's done? Uh, pancreas transplants are done, um, but they're almost always done when somebody has terrible diabetes, so their pancreas isn't working, and they have kidney failure. And, and the reason for that combination is they're gonna get a kidney transplant. And so they're already accepting the consequences of suppression of their immune system. And so they don't need additional immunosuppression for the pancreas transplant. For a people with, without a pancreas, um, it's actually safer to have a good insulin um, treatment regimen and take the enzymes than to undergo a pancreas transplant with the required immunosuppression. Thank you for that. We do have a couple of people asking this question about um, digestive enzymes and if that's something that's recommended, supplementing with them. Uh, 
really only if there is evidence of um, inadequate pancreatic enzyme uh, uh, manufacture and delivery. Um, many people with pancreatic cancer and many people after pancreatic surgery will need pancreatic enzymes, but you really need to work with your doctor to ask the question, is there a deficiency that exists and um, can supplements help with that? Thank you. Well, this has been incredibly informative. I wanna let everyone know if you are interested in connecting with the experts from Columbia, you can call 212-305-9467. I did share that in the chat several times. I will also email that to everyone tomorrow. So you'll have that as well. Um, and Columbia has a, a host of doctors that can help you. And obviously, as you can see here, they work together to find out the right course of action for all of their patients. So I do also wanna let people know that this has been recorded. We will provide the link for you to be able to watch it again, um, share it, please share it with your family, your friends. We wanna get this information to as many people as possible. And doctors, I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Horowitz, Dr. Chabot, Dr. Manji. Thank you so very, very much for this incredibly valuable time together and demystifying pancreatic cancer for us. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you. And thank you to all the attendees for spending some of your afternoon with us. I wish you all to stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.